Go ahead. All right. Good so uh, this final lecture on on magnets and magnet scattering. Um, now, the principle of the computation I want to do today can be quite intensive, so I'm not going to go through it in complete detail. I'm just going to sketch to you how it is done and uh, why it's important to compute, why it's an important property of these giant magnets that we need in the computer. Um, but if there are any questions, please ask that you can make them off the words or give them a this afternoon. What I'm open to, and I can share more details of the computation with you if you are interested. All right, so just a short review of what we did so far. We studied um, uh, string theory on classical string theory on the R cross SQ subspace of ADS5 cross S5. But uh, we're in luck that what happens is that I can perform this pull minor deduction of, uh, of this classical string theory. And we show that the classic, and uh, just want to emphasize here, the classical string theory is equivalent to the sine water model. And the uh, sine water model is integrable for one. And uh, you can use tools of integrability to find lots of solutions for it. In particular, you can find the so-called multi-kink solutions. So say, for instance, the kink-kink solution. And if I inverse this full wire deduction back, then I get a solution of R plus S2. It turns out that the solution I get is a scattering solution of two magnets. Uh, this one I introduced in the last tutorial, but I'm just going to summarize what that was. So the scattering solution looks as follows. It's quite a long expression, but just bear with so it's a half 1 plus this a squared plus b squared minus 2ab sec hyperbolic in 1, sec hyperbolic in 2, minus 2ab and in 10 hyperbolics. 1, 10 hyperbolic, 2. And then you also need to define this r, which is equal to 1 minus 1 over b. This i, which is given by 1 over b, minus a, 10 hyperbolic, 1, minus b, 10 hyperbolic, 2, where these u's and a's and b's are functions of the momentum. Um, given as follows, so u1, this is equal to sigma minus tau cosine p1 and 2, over 
sine P1 over 2. U2 very similar, and the output is P1 over 2. And A is given by sine P1 over 2 over cosine P2 over, uh, P2 over 2, yeah, minus cosine P1 over 2. And B very similar, only with a sine P2 over 2 over cosine P2 over 2 minus cosine P1 over 2. Right. Now, um, this is the explicit solution. You can verify that this solves the equations of motion of classical sig theorem of arc SS2. But uh, as you look at these expressions, it might become clear that finding this solution directly from the equations of motion is a this task. I mean, these functions aren't very simple. They've got complicated um, dependencies on P's and on sigma and tau. Um, oh, let me just add this footnote here. We always have reparameterization invariants to choose T and T as we want. We chose them in a particular way here. And uh, this is going to give me a world sheet metric proportional to conformal gauge. Proportional to conformal gauge in this choice. Uh, but these are the solutions, and uh, as I say, you can plug them into the equation of motion and solve. But uh, one of the ways to derive them is to use the Paul Meyer deduction map to sign Gordon, write out the key kink solutions, invert that map, and these are then the ones that you're going to find from that procedure. All right, now in the tutorial I um, asked in the last question to derive some of the properties of the solution. And uh, this is what I'm going to be busy with for most of uh, today. To derive one very important property of these scattering solutions. And I'll also show you the relevance of that in the ADSC if you must want it. So, one of the pro two of the properties that we derived with the giant magnets last time was, uh, you know, we showed that the energy of these solutions uh, diverge. So too does J. But this combination E minus J gives me a finite answer and if I do the proportionality constants correct, it's square root lambda of number pi sine p over 2. Okay. So to conserve charges correspond to physical quantities of these um, magnets, and they're of course quite important in the study. So this quantity here will correspond to the anomalous dimensions of operators, and that you can do a check. With scattering solutions, there's an additional quantity that's going to be important you can also check by the correspondence, and I'm going to highlight this today. So, also in the tutorial, I asked you to study this solution in various limits. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on two of those limits, and use those in the procedure here today. Um, so, let's look at the following limit, for example. If I take U2 goes to infinity, what is going to happen then? Well, there's going to be a bunch of simplifications. Uh, this is because sec hyperbolic goes to zero, tan hyperbolic of u2 goes to one. Uh, this simplifies these expressions significantly. And uh, I showed you a trick of how to solve for tan hyperbolic of uh, u1 in terms of phi. And at the end of the day, you can then recast r as a function of phi using this. And what you find is that this is given by cosine P1 over 2 over cosine of phi plus P2 over 2. Right. And, uh, oh, sorry, this is for the U2 goes to minus infinity. Right? For the U1 goes to infinity, I eventually find R is given by cosine P2 over 2 over cosine of phi minus p1 right. Now let's just figure out what's the range of phi in this case. So in this case I know that this is a giant magnet, so this, and I want this to start at 1 and end at 1. So I can figure out from this that phi should, so I want the endpoints to produce a p1 over 2 for me. So it has to be p1 over 2 and I can minus P2 over 2 from this. Or I can take uh, minus P2 over 2, I have to subtract it minus P1 over 2. So I've messed these limits up a bit, but 5 runs in this range. 
So let me just swap them around. So 5 runs from minus P2 over 2 minus P1 over 2 up to minus P2 over 2 plus P1 over 2. These are the inputs. Well, this one, 5 is going to run from minus P2 over 2 plus P1 over 2 up to P2 over 2 plus P1 over 2. Alright, so if I was to draw that in a similar way to how I did it at the time I over here, let's take a circle and let's make one of the momenta really big, let's make a P1 really big, just to illustrate the point. Or much bigger than P2, however. So there's P1, there's P2. So this angle over here is P1, this angle over here is P2, and the whole angle they stretch over is P1 plus P2. So, so two at zero in Gutenberg's final C. Uh, sorry, you just a bit. Is P2 not zero? Yeah, in, uh, in the YouTube also by us, in the is, is that P2? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so in this one, um, P2 goes to zero, so that corresponds to this mega up here. And in this one, P1 goes to zero, so that corresponds to this one over here. So that's how I isolate these two. This is a limit for, say, depending on your choice of P's, but this is a in the limit where t goes to minus infinity. So I say that this is the initial configuration of the matons. This is the limit I take when t goes to minus infinity to isolate the one macron. And this is the limit I take when t goes to minus infinity to isolate the other macron. And this is how I figure out where they are positioned uh, in this, this space here. This is where I start. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I think that this may happy. So this is the initial configuration. Um, and now, when t goes to infinity, you can uh, take that expression again, and now just take u2 goes to plus infinity, u1 goes to minus infinity, and then the solution I get is the following, where it still starts and ends these endpoints that I fixed. But now the momentum of swaps, so now p1 there, p2 p1, p2, and again, as I said, the inputs are the same, so this still extends over P1 plus P2, the total momentum of everything. And this is when time goes to plus infinity. So as you can see, I started with this configuration for the magnons, I evolved in time to you know, infinity, uh, and uh, the two uh, magnons of swap positions, where the one with momentum P1 was on the left here, it's in the magnon with momentum P2 that's on the left here. Right. Now, <coughs> these configurations don't depend on time, right? So uh, they do depend on time. The way they depend on time is through this dependence on u1 uh, and u2, okay. and this carries the uh, time dependence. Ah, exactly. Exactly. Because oh yeah. So these are speculative solutions. Exactly. So um, you can plot this in in time. I I wanted to show uh, uh, if I yeah, was just doing that. Sorry, I, I, I but, uh, missed that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it's a good question. I think it's important to see where that uh, time addition is. So, how does this look as I evolve in time? Well, we start with this initial configuration. Now, I'm just going to draw this schematically. Uh, this is why I start in minus infinity. I wait for a very, very long time. Almost nothing happens. It's almost the same. Now, when I reach the point where tau is approximately close to zero, very really close to zero, now something starts happening. And what's happening here is that there uh, is this, I'm just going to start at the end points, this line is a good reference point. I start here, there's this cusp that develops. And this cusp now moves over to the other side, so I hold it a little shorter in time, start there and there. Now this goes to my and this should be a bit higher. There we go. And now I evolve even further. And now this is going to be really close to that there. 
And then the final prime position is, I'm just going to I'd be one of them, just to emphasize it. This is sort of why I ended up. So there's this cusp that, you know, around tau goes as close to zero, and it starts appearing, and this thing causes these magnets to shift positions. And then it's going to stay roughly in the same configuration, this, uh, for, you know, larger times. Um, I'll try to include um, something to put on the website, a little mathematical code, that just plots the solution as a function of tau. Uh, a parametric plot of R as a function of phi, uh, but this is what it looks like. Um, <coughs> Alright, so... So you did write the UT, U2 comes with a different sign. You write, you wrote U, U1, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so U2 will be sigma plus tau. Uh, so U2 is going to be the same. And let me just put an I there. The only difference is going to be that the momenta only the moment. Yeah, only the moment. So I was just trying to see whether t goes to minus infinity, u1 automatically goes to ah, yeah. infinity and I see. Goes yeah. to so I thought there would be a sign difference. No, you're quite right that your choice of momenta and whether they're positive or negative, yeah. this is going to affect, if I say t goes to minus infinity, which of these limits oh, is going the to be positive. Exactly, yeah, exactly. The energy is actually really the absolute value of the momenta. Really. Sorry, sorry. 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 U2 goes minus infinity limit only realized in the case of P2 equal 0, but not that. From that definition. Um, I may have made a mistake in my computations, thank you. Um, but um, at least the way I did it in the code, this came out as figuring out the initial configurations. Um, as I said, I may have made a mistake, a mistake in it, um, but uh, I, this is at least. Uh, as far as I could see, the, the you know the numbers across one with the initial configurations and, and the final ones. But um, I, I think the signs aren't that important. The, the important point is what does this thing do schematically? And what it does schematically is that for a very long time the configuration looks approximately like this, and then there's a very short time where these two momenta via this uh, cusp that starts appearing switches position, and then it remains in this configuration for a very long period. And this is reflected by the fact that you have a tan hyperbolic here. And a hyperbolic term, tangent function is, of course, close to minus 1 for most of its life. And then uh, when it comes close to 0, then there's the sudden shift up to plus 1. And that's exactly what you found in the soliton solutions. Of course, let's discuss that. And in fact, these two are completely related. Right? These king king solutions are solitonic solutions. Really, the solutions we're studying are just these solutions in the skies. And uh, that's exactly why you see this kind of behavior appear from here. And for a very short time, there's this really dramatic shift in the moments. Alright, but now, what's the property that I want to study uh, these solutions? Well, as I said, that uh, these are scattering solutions. So I start with a uh, configuration with uh, momentum P1 and P2. Uh, I go to the opposite limit in time, and these two have swapped. And now what you can find in that is that there is some sort of phase shift that is happening. So it's going to be the same configuration of the two salt, potentially with an additional phase shift that's happening. And it's this phase shift that I want to sit down computing, just showing you that there is a phase shift hidden in that expression of it. Okay. And I'll sketch very simply how you go about expecting it. So to do that, let's uh, let's start with just going to keep the solution on the port. That's going to be and put it for us as a reference point. Uh, but the point is that I'm studying two magnets scattering in a wall sheet, in a network of a wall sheet network that is conform. So the correct point of comparison here should be a single magnet with a wall sheet network that's conform. Um, and in the first tutorial, I gave you the giant magnet exactly in conform dimension. And uh, so I'm just going to, this was a specific choice of damage. And now I'm going to want to show you what does the giant magnet look like in the conform damage. So just to be right with that, very similar, uh, t is equal to tau. And phi is given by tan inverse tan p over 2 tan hyperbolic of u. So you can show that this gives me a metric proportional for a formal gauge or C 
single macro. Right. Now, <coughs> what can potentially happen, or I haven't exploited all the freedom in writing fine yet, and I possibly could. Um, <coughs> most freedom I can have is I can, of course, have a shift in the fine. So let's just you know that little. So phi is given by this expression over here, tan inverse, tan of tan of over two, tan hyperbolic of u. But it could potentially be a shift in phi. So the phi is you know runs from not minus p over two to p over two, but minus p over two plus some phi to the minimum, up to p over two uh, plus some phi to the minimum. And there could potentially be a shift in this u. So um, I think in my notes I have this minus, but the sign doesn't matter. There could potentially be some shift in the uh, This is the genetic form I'm going to get from these expressions that I have over here. I'm going to get some expression that looks very similar to this, uh, but there's going to be these shifts in it. Now the question is, how am I going to isolate? Well, let's just write the expression of what you're generically going to find in these notes. So, tan of phi. Let's say I give you something like this, e times a times e to the 2 u plus b over c e to the 2 u plus d. Alright? Now, you can say, well, what should a, b, c, and d be? Or, you know, what's the corresponding values for them to reproduce phi minimum, p, and q0 for me? But you can compute this. So you can say that p is some you know, function of A, B, C, and D. Compute that. It's a little fine, man. But the only one I want to focus on is, given this, how do I extract U0 from A? Well, I'm going to take U0 is equal to a quarter times the logarithm of A squared plus C squared or B squared plus D squared. Right. So if I tell you that tag of phi is of this form, then there is some shift in U associated with this form that I've written here, and it's given by this. Let me just show you that this does actually work for a very simple example. Let's take a giant magnet so example that I have there. I know that in this case, phi is equal to tan P over 2 times tan hyperbolic of U. But now let's just add a, a shift in U to that and show you that that expression just ex does extract the good. Let's, extract, let's subtract the zero of that. What is this? Uh, oh, this is given by tan of phi. Is this? I've just taken the half tan of my tan on both sides. What do I get? Well, I get tan p over two. Let's chop this tan Tan p over two. And now I'm just going to expand tan of the body and write it in terms of exponentials. Uh, you can show that the following bonds, e to the 2u times e to the minus u0 plus, oh, this should be a minus, e to the u0 over e to the 2u dot e to the minus u0 plus e to the u0. Right. So that's what I get just from expanding this form for 10 phi. And um, I can identify from this that a is given by, so A is the coefficient at the top A of e to the 2u. So that is going to be tan squared p over 2 multiplied by p to the minus u0. B is going to be given by <coughs> tan p over 2 times, uh, uh, this should be a minus e to the u0. C is given by just that coefficient over there, e to the minus u0, and D is given by e to the u0. Right. And now let's plug this into the formula that I gave there for how to compute the shift in u0. I'll show that this does work. So I said what you must do is take a quarter of the logarithm of a squared plus c squared. So that's going to be tan hyperbolic squared p over the, oh sorry, did I, no, this shouldn't be a squared, sorry, this should just be tan p over two. Tan hyperbolic, the a squared, yeah, in this formula I need to make a squared. So 
a stand of polygon, then squared p over 2 plus 1 times e to the minus u0. That's from a squared plus c squared. And from b squared plus d squared, I get tan squared p over 2 plus 1. Uh, oh, and there should be squared, so there's a minus 2 u0, and there's a e to the 2 u0 at the bottom. Alright, now this factor cancels top and bottom, then square p over 2 plus 1. And I'm just left with a quarter plus the long of e to the minus 4 u0, and that's just minus u0. And that's exactly what we should get. There's a shift in u minus u0, that's exactly what you get from utilizing this formula over here. So this formula here, given an expression of this form, extracts from me what's the shift in u0. Now the reason that's important is because u, as we've said, is given by this formula over here. So u is related to uh, sigma at the time. So if there's going to be a shift in u0, I can absorb that as a shift in my time point. So there's going to be some shift in time, potentially, if I say u1 goes to infinity or minus infinity. Let me show you that that is explicitly what happens. So, again, this computation may be a bit long, so I'm not going to um, go for all of the details with this. But I do ask you to study these limits uh, in the tutorial, and this is exactly what you do. So let's send u1 goes to plus or minus, plus or minus infinity. Then uh, what happens is that d goes to a half 1 plus a squared plus b squared minus 2ad tan hyperbolic u2 i goes to 1 over d times plus minus a minus b tan hyperbolic u2 right. now the plus minus comes with the fact that tan swaps sides with its plus or minus um, and uh, what this limit does is I'm focusing on the second magnum at time goes to plus minus infinity. So u1, the absolute value of u1 goes to infinity, isolates the second magnum for me, and uh, the sign corresponds to am I studying the second magnum at time is minus infinity or time is plus infinity. As you can see, these expressions are quite different, and uh, I give you the general formula for tan phi over there. Um, oh, I should put this, I think actually if I write this down, my apologies. It's, it's in the same tutorial, let me just get that for you quickly. So I get this R, I, and D. And uh, the way that I relate it to my uh, usual variables is T is just tau, R is equal to this function R that I have over cosine of phi. And phi, tan phi, is given by i over r. Right, so this comes from the tutorial, this is the general solution. Tan phi is equal to i over r. So you can see I'm going to get tan phi. I need to take the expression for i and the expression for r, and that's a function of d. Take the ratio, and that's going to give me tan phi. Yes? Sorry, what is the numerator for r? Numerator for r. Um, so that should be 1 minus 1 over d. Oh, yeah, so this is big r. Sorry, thank you. So that's big r. That's this expression of here, 1 minus 1 over d. Uh, but we're actually not going to focus on, uh, on r here at all. This is just a function of phi. And we've already showed that all that happens with r when I have it as a function of phi is there's some shift in phi that happens with these two, the plus minus infinity. The time dependence of the problem is really still sitting in what does phi look like. I figure out what phi looks like. Phi is the one that carries this explicit tau dependence. If I study that, then I'll know what the time shift or first the u shift is, and I can convert that u shift into a time shift. If that makes sense. Um, so let me just uh, have the expression that you get. So the expressions I get is the following in the two limits. I plug those in and I get tan phi is equal to. So this is in the u1 goes to the minus infinity limit, 
I get minus 2a minus b plus 2a plus b e to the 2u2 over minus 1 plus a minus b squared plus e to the 2u2 a plus b squared minus 1. And if I take the opposite limit, u1 goes to plus infinity, then I get tan phi plus equal to 2a plus b plus 2a minus b e to the 2u2 over minus 1 plus a plus b squared plus a minus b squared minus 1 e to the 2u2. Right. So you can see that my expressions for tan phi here is different. So you have an a minus b, you have an a plus b, you have an a plus b, you have an a minus b, and that's basically the swap that happens all the b goes to minus b in the one limit um, if I take these two different ones. We've already seen this difference reflect in a different phase. So, you know, where I initially had, um, say, the mag, this is the magon with uh, p2, this was sitting over there. And then at infinite time, or at the opposite limit of time, it's now sitting over there. So there is a shift in phi minimum happening due to this, but there's also a shift in u0 happening due to this. Um, and uh, you can plug that in, and uh, you get some expression. As I said, you plug it into this expression. What's u0 over t is equal to minus infinity? What's u0 over t goes to plus infinity? There's a difference between the two. Um, and uh, the difference is not, it's not a nice formula, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna write that down explicitly. It's not too messy, but uh, I don't think it's too important. The important bit is that there is a U shift that's happening. So U0 for Magnum 2, time goes to plus infinity, minus U0 for Magnum 2, the time goes to minus infinity, this is not zero, but some finite of the delta u that you can compute from these two formulas. And as I said, this is indicative of a time shift that's happening as these two magnons move past each other, i.e. there's a scattering process in the same place. Now, how do I get uh, the time shift? Well, I just look at my definition for u over here. I see that well, tau is related to uh, u1 in the following point. If I want to absorb this change in u as a time shift, what I need to do is delta t is going to be equal to, I think it's minus delta u over cotangent of p2. Right, so there is a time shift that we do to these two. And, uh, now, the time shift is not something that I can have a via the ABS CFT correspondence because time shift is just something that tells me about how the Wolchi coordinates uh, have shifted. And there's no notion of the Wolchi coordinates in the dual gauge view. Uh, what I can compare is this quantity called the phase shift. And what the phase shift measures for me is how does, okay, well, let me just write out the definition for it. That's how does this quantity, if I that it's the relative with respect to the energy, this should give me delta t. So this is the phase shift, this is the quantity I'm after. And what I'm basically asking is, when I vary this with respect to energy, then this should give me delta t. Note that delta t is going to be a function of p1 and p2. Right? You can compute this, they do this computation in the giant magnum paper um, by the author of Sainer. Let me just rewrite this a little. So you're going to take delta 1, 2 over delta P2 times delta epsilon 2 over delta P2 inverted. That's giving me delta T, which is a function of P1 and P2. Now I multiply this on the other side, integrate this over P2. Let me just tell you the final answer that you get. <coughs>
So the final answer you get is the following one. This phase shift between these two is given by delta lambda of pi. Uh, after I've restored perfect units now, this delta lambda of pi comes from my expression for the energy times uh, yeah, this should be multiplied with everything. You get something like cos p2 over 2 minus cos p1 over 2 plus log of 1 minus cos p1 minus p2 over 2, I think over 1, plus, uh, 1 minus cos p1 plus p2 2 log, close that bracket and then I'm going to minus p1 square root of lambda pi sine p2 now the explicit value of this isn't too important the only thing I want to show you is that you get an expression for what's called the phase shift between these two, and this is a non trivial expression. So if I can find a matching between this and the gauge field quantity, this is a really non trivial check of the fact that the correspondence is in fact working. Um, and as you can see, it has dependencies of both P2 and P1. And this is something that we're going to, well, I'm just going to tell you what it is due to, and I can tell you that this check does work. Oh, just one final note we worked in conformal gauge. So this is a, you know, this is just something to keep in mind. And I've computed this in a formal gauge. Uh, what does that mean? Well, my wall sheet metric is given by minus one, zero, zero, one. Um, so the derivative of, so E dot is equal to one. So that means that um, I work in a gauge where, um, you know, the energy is, is, is chosen as a, um, uh, Actually, the words escape me now. But the point is, I work at a specific gauge, and that's just something to keep in mind when I perform perform the check. All right. Now, I just want to pause here and just emphasize again: the explicit steps on two. What's important here is that I start with two magnons. These magnons, uh, you know, approach each other. Uh, Let me maybe draw a picture here. Let's work in these kinds of coordinates. What does the solution look like? Well, for a single magnet, I'm going to get something that asymptotically is an R is equal to 1. Same for the other side. But then there's a small region around U is equal to 0 where I get a bump. So this is for a single magnet. For two magnets, I get that if I look at time goes to minus infinity, then I'm looking at two bumps and I'm well separated. They're two separate magnets. That's why I also get that picture, um, you know, where that's just two straight lines on a half-life plane. So this is P1 and this is P2. Now what's going to happen? Well, these two are going to approach each other. When these bumps start coming into close contact with one another, so I do this bump over here, and almost done with its extent, I get the other bump something is going to happen. Right. That's why I'm just going to delete that little part. It can be a really complicated shape for the way that's happening over there. But this, you know, I can still think of this as moving P1 and P2. And then after, you know, a long time, I'm going to get this configuration where they're again all separated. And now I've got P2 on this side, P1 on this side, and there's a potential power shift that's happened. Why is this power shift happened? It's because of this interaction between them. Because they met each other, there's some, if you want to call it a, a friction, as they try to move over each other. And this is inflicted in a time delay um, in this, and it's a time delay that I can extract of a certain computation. Right. Now, let me just have a look at how much time I've left. I just want to tell you what does this quantity correspond to in the gauge field picture? And then uh, I'm not going to do any computation to convince you of this, but I can tell you that this on table quantity can be matched with an uh, you know, appropriate quantity on the gauge field side, and this is a uh, reasonably sophisticated check that things are in fact working out. Just have a look. 
right. So I should actually be happy. Oh, so I think this is the last bit that I'm going to be able to say. So as I've emphasized in the previous lecture, these things are due to single trace operators. So let's just work with the single one. One now. What does this mean? This means that I'm thinking of single trace operators with a very large number of Zs. To be explicit, square root in the number of Zs. And then somewhere in here, I insert one. Let's say this is at position L1. And then the Zs just go on forever, uh, basically. So I've got exactly one Y, one corresponds to the one nagel. Uh, Zs goes like square root in. But what do I associate with the momentum of this? Well, the momentum of this, I'm going to think of sum over all the possible positions of this y. So sum over L1. And multiply this expression of an appropriate phase. e to the i p1 times L1. That's where the momentum is this thing. It tells me something about the phase that's happening with the different position that this y can take in this very long term. What happens if I have two magnets? Well, now I'm studying this one. Trace in a large number of Zs. And I've got A1 at position of L1. Zs. And then at another position, I've got another one at position of L2. And then a bunch of Zs going on the other. I'm again going to sum over all possible positions of this one, L1, L2. Multiply this with an appropriate phase. Yeah. It's e to the i p1 l1. Now it's e to the i p2 l2. But I sum over all positions, not over all of them, but I sum over all the ones where l2 is greater than l1. So right. And now what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to act with this. The, the equivalence of time evolution is the dilatation operator in the, um, the gauge theory. And what the gauge, what the dilatation operator is going to do is it's going to start shifting this y around. I can think of these z's as representing um, a position. So, you know, this infinitely long position I have over here, this is basically the infinite number of z's that I have. All the z's in between these two y's, there's an inner large number of z's, and all the ones asymptotically here is an inner number of z's. Now, I have the dilatation operator enough that starts swapping these y's around. I'm going to reach a point where these y's are sitting really close to one another. That's what's happening over here. So I've still got an infinite number of z's, but in between them, I've only got a small number of z's, all the one z's. Now something's going to happen with these two, and they're eventually going to swap after that. But what happens after they swap? Well, we're summing over L2 greater than L1. After they've swapped, I'm going to end up with an operator that looks like a bunch of Zs. I'm going to get a Y at position L1. But now the one in L1 is going to carry the momentum, not P1, but this is going to carry the momentum. And this is not carrying the moment P1. So if I want to write this um, schematically, let's say that I want to define a function that tells me the position of these guys. You know, it tells me something about their swapping. That's going to schematically look like you know, your psi is going to be. I start off with an e to the i p1 l1 plus i p2 l2. But then, you know, I'm going to also have you know, this wave where you know, I've swapped. So I have p1, but p1 is now at position l2, and p2 is now at position l1. And there must be some coefficient multipliers. You know, in principle, there can be a phase in front. That tells me you know, uh, about this. I can set up, uh, you know, and then I can ask, well, what is going to happen if the dilatation operator actually leaves? They must be eigenfunctional piece. And I can use this expression to compute 
delta and a from this. What should a be for this? Um, and uh, this a that we've computed is exactly this e to the i delta 1 to this, in this limit. Right? And that's the check that you're going to do. Now, for those of you who have studied this before, you might already see a bit of a problem. You know, when I do this procedure on the gauge field side, I'm going to do this perturbatively. I'm going to say the dilatation operator, I'm going to expand as, you know, I've got one B of dimension D0, plus one that swaps nearest neighbors, so ones that differ with a single site, plus ones that differ with two sites, etc. When I take the lambda goes to infinity limit, you know, this is not something that I can reach with this kind of argument because then I really need to sum them all up all the way to you know, a dilatation operator that swaps things that differ with an infinite space. So how do I get this quantity from this argument even to compare it with? Well, there's a really fantastic argument. If you guys are interested, I think this is one of the seminal works in the correspondence where uh, Isaac showed well, it's a series of papers. Isaac initially showed that with the symmetry argument, I get the energies of these magnet solutions out from representation theory of the symmetry algebra. And I can go further and I can compute the S matrix up to a global phase, e to the i phi, that's what's called the kinematic S matrix. The kinematic S matrix in its form is completely fixed by symmetry. <clears throat> this is this was shown. Now this is not the full story. This phase is important because it turns out that when I take this lambda goes to infinity limit, the kinematic part goes to one. So this quantity I want to compare with is exactly this phase that the symmetry argument doesn't give. But in the follow-up papers, it was shown that you can determine this phase with an additional symmetry requirement, what's called crossing symmetry. If I impose crossing symmetry. And I assume integrability of the uh, of the system, and those two really give me this phase out. And it's this phase that I can outcome compare with this e to the i delta one two. And you will see in the paper that they show that these two match exactly with one another. And as I want to emphasize, this is a really long-term project that things are really working as they should, and all these things do match with one another. Um, I've really only sketched it a bit, I couldn't give a lot of details. It's also because these arguments can be quite involved. We have a series of lectures on their own. But for anyone interested, please check them out. And I, uh, as I said, I just wanted to emphasize that this is a quantity we can compute in these magnet scattering problems. This quantity, delta R2. And this really corresponds to something else that we can check from the gauge fix side. That we can fix with a bunch of symmetry arguments. And, uh, but these two really match, and this is why it's a, yeah, it's a really nice one to a really good check the correspondence. Um, Alright, I think that's it for the common of the lectures that I want to do. Are there any questions for me? Uh, if you'd like to just answer before we talk uh, the um, On which website I can upload the submissions? Oh, um, there's the school website. The school website, yes. Yeah. It's going to be on the school website. Do um, you know the address for that? Not sure. yet. Not yet. But uh, just, just uh, you know, uh, follow the money something to for medical physics. Uh, I'm not going to upload these solutions on there. I'll give you a few mathematical notebooks that you can play around with. And, uh, you know, that will give you some insight into these solutions and so on. The symmetry argument, I'm afraid, uh, I'll give you uh, the references for the papers, but those are really the best sources uh, for that. Uh, I would do it in justice if I was to summarize it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's basically all I have for you in terms of my methods. If there are any questions, please uh, contact me here in the right. I'm always uh, open to answer any questions. That you